Hello, I'm Rhonda Hayes, and today I'd like to share some ideas with you about how to teach young children to read, beginning with the ABCs. It might be a kindergartner or even a first, second, or third grader who you might have in your classroom, but you realize they don't know their ABCs. And it's very difficult and really not appropriate to try to teach them to read until they've mastered their alphabet. So let's dig in to see what we can learn today. Here's a picture of my grandson, Mac. He's um, not quite one and a half years old yet. And you can see that he already knows a lot about books. He can hold it in his hands. He knows the picture tells the story, and if he sees a picture of something that he recognizes, and if he knows how to say the word, he could try to say the word. Like if he saw a dog, he, he would try to say the word dog. But young children um, really begin um, to bring a lot of understandings um, to learning to read um, more than we may even realize. I'd like to share some things with you about letters, sounds, and words, just to build some background knowledge. Before a child can learn the name of a letter and the sound that goes with that letter, the child has to notice the features, the distinctive features of the letters. What makes one letter be different from another letter in the alphabet? They have to really know how to look at print. And oftentimes, teachers of upper grades children um, who, are, who have children in their classroom who do not know their alphabet, they don't realize that you can't just start teaching them to read without the children knowing these distinctive features. It's very important. So um, from birth, children, uh, and even before birth, many people would probably agree with me that when a child is in the womb, the child is beginning to develop some very implicit awareness of phonological, um, the phonological system. They learn what talking sounds like. Um, a lot of people believe that because they read to their babies while they're in their womb and they sing to them, dance and things like that. And so, um, once a child is born, they grow so fast before you know it, they are trying to imitate the sounds that the mother's, father's, parents, or other people are making. Um, they're ooing and aahing, they're babbling, cooing. And so phonological awareness is an important predictor of a child. Um, beginning to learn to read. And I've heard people even say that if a child can't rhyme, they're not going to be able to learn to read. So it's important that children have this phonological awareness that they can feel the rhyme and rhythm and cadence of the language. They, they don't need to master the name of the letter in order to begin to use what, what we would consider print, right? And, um, and then lastly, Children have the concept of words once they can put words together and talk. They may not know that the language has distinctive units like what we would call a word because children begin to imitate talk. I know I've seen um, children who can memorize like songs or scripture, the Pledge of Allegiance, and they're just very young. And to listen to them, it's, it's it's just so precious because they don't form the letters exactly right. They don't articulate perfectly, but they are beginning to put that together. And so if you have a child that can see, they can hear, and they can talk, we should be able to teach that child to learn to read. Um, it might take a different pathway for one child versus another in order for us to reach the child. Dr. Richard Allington is a leader in the field of literacy. You may have read this book that he's written um, about what really matters with struggling children, with tr struggling readers, and you may have read some of his articles. He's very um, well known. He says, and I've taken this quote from this particular book, 
that one third of the entering kinder kindergartners who don't know their letter names are likely to become the one third of the fourth graders that are reading below grade level. He also says that all students, regardless of their poverty and their past experiences, they should know their letters by Halloween of kindergarten. Now, I'm, I'm making this video in the middle of October, and some kindergarten teachers that are watching may be thinking, oh my gosh, uh, my children are not, are not going to meet that goal. Well, that's okay. Go ahead and, and set a new goal. Make it November the 30th. Strive for your children to, to all know their alphabet by that date. And if that doesn't work out, then make another goal. But you've got to aim for, for goals. And I love the idea of by kindergarten, um, mid-year, October um, the, the 31st, that's, that's really great because it's early enough in the year for children to then begin to learn to read. So what about children in other grades? Some of you may find that first, second, third graders don't know their alphabet, or you may not be sure if they know it, or you may not have even thought about that they might not know their alphabet. But if you've given them a benchmark assessment and you've found that you have children that are scoring on, on that assessment, if for example, it's a Fountas and Pinnell um, assessment where you use the alpha um, letters and they are scoring at levels A and B, those are very low levels, very beginning levels. And if you have children that have scored those levels in, in these grades that I've mentioned, uh, my advice to you would be to administer a letter identification test because it could very well me be that they don't know many of their letters. And if they don't, it's, it's not going to be helpful or the right thing for, for the child for you to try to teach them to read because they are not going to be able to decode the words in the text. Now, if it's the beginning of the year in kindergarten, these are the practices that I, I like to abide by. The first day of school, I have the children write their name. If they can write first and last name, that's fine. I accept whatever they have. And then I let them write their name several times over the course of the year because I love to be able to show parents and the students, this is what your writing looked like at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year. I also let them draw a picture of themselves and I love to score it based on the draw a man or draw person test because you can look at the points that they accumulate and tell so much about the child's abilities. I also administer the letter identification test from um, the observation survey those of you who know me, you know that I'm a former reading recovery teacher, and this is the letter ID test that I've always administered. There's several out there. Whatever you use is fine. This particular assessment allows the child to name the letter or name uh, a, the sound the letter makes or to name a word that begins with that letter. So um, I would tally it up and I would make sure that I know which letters each child knows and then which ones they need to work on. There are three essential pieces that every classroom needs, um, in my opinion. And one is um, that an ABC chart. You need a, a big class chart, a poster size one, and then every child needs a small one that they, they can access and you can refer to, like during writer's workshop. You need, need a name chart because children need to see their names and know they're valued, and you need a word wall. Now, we'll dig deeper into each of those and learn a little bit more. Um, the reason why these are so important is because the, to learn in the alphabet, to learn the letters, that, that doesn't need to be done in isolation. And your, your classroom shouldn't exist like in a vacuum, one particular component. So you want to create 
a really print rich environment for your children so that they can thrive. You, you want to write stories together through like interactive writing at least once a day and more if possible. You can write during science and social studies and math. You want to read aloud every day quality children's picture books and chapter books, maybe a chapter a day before lunch or after recess. You want to read big books. And then when you're reading those big books, you want to do things such as point out the alphabet letters and words and conventions. And I love to play this little game called Show Me What You Know once children have learned some things. Here are some routines that you want to establish and they um, flow like this. So step one, to learn the alphabet, you're going to want to put into practice phonemic awareness activities. So that would mean things like reading ABC books, having nursery rhymes, um, picture books, chapter books, um, and you just want to read, read, read. So many of the things that I've already mentioned, that those are the first steps that you take in helping children to learn the alphabet. Step two is you want to teach the letter name and you want to teach their sound. And that's why that alphabet chart and the name chart and the word wall, all of those are essential. Step three, you want them to be able to write the letter and you want to teach them how to write the letter by using a verbal pathway so that you could um, formally speak out loud how to form the letter. For example, if the child is making a capital or writing a capital A, you would say, pull down, pull down and across. Step four is you want to do sorting activities where they sort letters and sounds using pictures. And then um, step five is you want to always connect to the reading because letter sounds and connecting them into actual words is really going to solidify the knowledge with the child. And then lastly, step six, you want to extend the letter knowledge any way that you can with any kind of additional um, letter sound activities. So these are the routines that you want to establish in your classroom. And now I'll share more about what that looks like, sounds like, and feels like. So if you have an alphabet chart, if you want to enlarge it and put it on a Google slide or a PowerPoint slide, if that's what you use every day in your classroom to start your morning, then by all means do that. But you need to also have one posted in your classroom because you're not going to be able Able to um, keep that slide up all the time and you'd want to read it um, every day for many days and you it would sound like this a a acorn a a apple b b bear c cat. So you're reading letters and sounds and you're reading the pictures. You might just read the letters. You might just read the pictures. You might read it diagonally, backwards. There are many ways over time that you could read it so that it's not every day exactly the same thing. So I hope these activities will help you keep your ABC chart fresh, but please make sure you remember to read it every day. Here's an example of the name chart. You need to also read that daily at the beginning of the year. In the um, upper grades, like first, second, third grade, fourth, fifth, you might have middle name charts or last name charts. Typically in kindergarten, I just have a first name chart. Um, you can see how I've built it by clustering the letters, um, the first letter of of the names that are in common and I've written that letter in a color and used a, that color marker to draw a ring around it. I would like to confess that I did not put all of these names in alphabetical order by second and third letter and so I hope you'll forgive me for that. I did not take the time to redo this chart. It was one that I had from um, a practice that I was doing and so it's just an example. It's one of those things where I hope that you can do better than me. But as you're um, making connections to 
um, the name chart, it would work like this. So you're conferring with a child and he says, um, I'm writing a story about my dog. I don't know how to spell dog. And then the teacher might say, well, the word dog works like David's name. Listen to the first letter in dog, dog. Now listen to the first letter in David. So how do you think, what letter do you think dog begins with? Then a word wall is very important to have. It's one of the first true resources like a dictionary that children would have where you have um, uh, the letters are put on white index cards and then the teacher builds this word wall with the children so they learn how to find words in alphabetical order. They learn how to find and locate um, specific words. I love that um, this is in um, set up with that black sheet and um, I love how Marisa has let the children help color a picture to go with the letter and while I'm at it let me thank my dear friend Marisa Whittington for sharing pictures so um, from her class so freely with me and um, I've added the environmental print pictures because that might be something that you'd like to add as well. Learning about letters and words um, long, long ago, and maybe possibly even today, you have teachers that were teaching uh, a letter of the week. It was a very common practice. But there are lots of limitations with that because you might have children who are spending the large amounts of time learning letters that they may already know and that work on the letters may be out of context, meaning it's not in continuous text. Also, the letter of the week suggests to children and to parents that certain letters are word are learned first and that they have to be learned in a sequence before children can ever learn to read. And in reality, all of the learning's taking place at the same time. They're learning the letters, the sounds, and how to put those into words simultaneously. And the more those connections can be made all together, the faster children will learn the sounds and the letters and the alphabet. And so if you have children who are struggling, it might be that you need to be um, pay more attention to um, incorporating all these different contexts of learning. Now, here are all the ways you want to engage in the letters with the children. You want them to learn how they look. You want them to be able to write them. You want them to be able to play with letters, to, to have fun with them, to be able to make words, to be fast and flexible with their word solving skills. Please remember that they will usually learn the letters in their name first and their family members and their friends. Those are the letters that they will learn first. Now, the things that I've mentioned so far, that alphabet chart and the name chart, those are things that I do whole group. But I also believe it's important for you to, to pull small groups. And here's an example of something you might do in a small group. I like to keep the groups fast paced. I might spend 10 to 12, possibly 15 minutes with the group. It's usually a fairly short amount of time. I do a big variety of things. You may not want to do all of these, but I think it is important to remember to vary the activities. So the first thing that I might do is have them come sit at the table. I might have the name puzzles out, let them put their name puzzles together. I'm watching and making notes of how they're doing. And, and then they put it together one time and then I want to see them write their name. I'll be noticing, you know, if they're able to do it, I'll be noticing letter formations and making any notes and then jumping in to assist as needed. Then I would quickly take those away and move into letter identification work. I might have already started an ABC book with the children with um, and every child would have their own ABC book with the letters that they know. I might say, find a letter in your ABC book that you know and touch it. Tell me what the letter is. Then whatever letter they need to each child needs to learn next, then we would add to the letter book. We would do um, that would 
quickly finish and then I would do fun, a phonological awareness. Maybe as I'm collecting those books, I might sing a good morning song or the ABC song or do a nursery rhyme. I might even do a jump rope rhyme. And then quickly I might pull out the ABC chart and I might find and locate the letters in some of the children's names and maybe have them guess whose letter, whose name is this. And then quickly that activity would, would shift and, and I would pull out an easy to read level text, like a level A book. And I would read it aloud like a read aloud. I might let them echo read with me. I'm not expecting them to read it, but I'm helping to connect letters and sounds and to continuous text. That's important. And then before I put the book away, I would do a little bit with print concepts like first of the book, last of the book, front page, back page, um, left to right. I would only do one or two of those things because it's very fast. Then before they leave, I might do one thing where um, I'm letting them do some word work with magnetic letters. They might be building a sight word, uh, maybe a word that's in the book. Maybe I let them write something together, or maybe I have Play-Doh out and real quick, I let them roll with Play-Doh, create a letter, their name or something like that. So that's the kind of work I would do on a regular basis in small groups. Here's um, an example of the kind of sorting that children would do. One thing I'd like you to notice about this picture is that appears the child is standing up. That is really important, especially for children who are struggling, because when they're standing up, they'll be moving more of the whole of their whole arm. And that's a, a gross motor movement versus just using their hands. And so for struggling students in particular, I'm going to let them stand up so that they can involve gross motor movement. Um, examples of how you would sort might be like in this picture, if the letters have a hole or if they don't have a hole. It's important important for them to learn the differences between H and N and R and U. I love to do a sort with, can you find the letters that have a, the tunnel? Um, so you can see the other sorts there. It's great to do tactile learning experiences with children. I love this one where they're taking Play-Doh and um, pressing in with some type of uh, some type of little plastic stick. You might could use um, a toothpick or possibly the end of a, of a pencil or something like that. You could make um, their name on paper and then let them roll up little pieces of tissue paper and glue it on. And that makes a three-dimensional name. You can, of course, do pipe cleaners and let them fill, touch, trace, um, rub with crayons, um, with a put a piece of paper on top of it and do a rubbing. I love for them to take magazines and um, whether I cut the letters out or a para or um, even a parent and let them sort by using colorful images for like capital letter G, lowercase letter G. Um, there are many ways that you can create tactile experiences for children. Here are a few more. You might take popsicle sticks or even cut paper strips out that resemble popsicle sticks so that they can form letters. I love the activity with chalk because so many people are doing chalk outside now and um, that way it works is the teacher writes the alphabet, the letters, or possibly other children could write the letters. And then one child says them. And if they say it, say, say, if they say the letter name correctly, then they can spray it. Um, the name puzzles that are, are really important to have. Here's a great image of it. You write their name on a, a, on a sentence strip, and then you write the name again, exactly the same size as the previous one. Then you cut the letter, um, each letter, and then they can match the letter. You keep it in an envelope, um, and then having the, their letter name um, with magnetic letters is, is really great to keep together, then they might even have a letter name book, and in that little booklet, um, they might have one page for every letter in their name. So those are just some examples. Here are other ways that you could sort. Sometimes people just sort by color. Then you could sort by consonant vowels, lowercase, uppercase, 
cocktails and circles. There are many ways that you can sort, but oftentimes um, if you're an upper grades teacher, you may not be aware of these things that you could do that would help the children learn the distinctive features of the letters because they need that before they can learn the letter names, before they can learn the sounds. I hope that you're begin, beginning to build or have already built a great collection of alphabet books that's just critical for you to have. Read those several a day at the beginning of the year and do things, activities with them where you're pointing to the name, children are let, or or naming the letters, then let them create their own alphabet book. Um, and this is something every child in the class could have. I mentioned that with the small group um, in, um, on the, a few slides previously. Um, letter books are also essential. And this is different than an alphabet book because in a letter book, every page is about one specific letter. And there, this really helps to build um, a, a repertoire of words that begin with that letter sound. You want to make sure that you're teaching letters within continuous text. It's a lot more challenging for children to notice those letters. And you, you just want to do it um, at the same time that you're teaching them in isolation. Immediately take it into text and say, can you find a one here? Can you find this letter here on this page? At the beginning, it's going to be hard for children because everything looks like squiggly lines, squiggly letters. And then eventually, once they start noticing their feature, those features, then they start to notice um, and they're able to find the letters in the words. It's really a lot of fun to watch. Creating shared reading materials that have the children's names in it is a wonderful idea that makes readable books for the children. Um, you might take several days to create it and then you might read it um, for several days and then um, you could use this to help your children um, begin to learn to cross check and I'm going to in, a, in another slide I'll share more about cross checking but here are some ideas you might make a class book about um, our kindergarten class every child has a page and it would say Melissa is in our class Johnny is in our class so one sentence where every child, um, each child has a page. Another example might be Melissa likes to jump, Susie likes to jump, Johnny likes to jump, um, or whatever activity it is they say they like to do. Play, skip, hop, ride bike, swim, hunt. So using um, a mask like um, I've seen people use a fly swatter, um, that's a great mask. They, you can make a mask out of um, just a handle like a paint stirrer and put a cardboard on it. Or you can buy a mask from a teacher supply store. Um, you can use highlighter tape. I love to buy that. It, it's skinny um, and it's some wide. Sometimes they have it at the Target dollar section in that um, dollar, three dollar, five dollar section. And you can mask all different kinds of things that really helps draw attention to letters and, and words. Now, here's the slide about cross-checking that I mentioned. So you might cover a few words in the story. And when the students come to those covered words, you want them to make a prediction about what they think the word might be. And then you write the predictions down for them. And then you'll uncover the first letter of the word. Um, maybe you've used a, a like a sticky pad piece of paper to cover up a mask and you gently peel it off and you, you let them see the first letter and see was their prediction right and then you can continue to uncover until you can confirm the word. So learning to cross check is a really critical skill for young readers. In interactive writing, it's very high support for teachers because the teacher and the students create the message together and they share the pen with the teacher and the teacher is going to select the focus for the writing. And it might be something like hearing um, the beginning sound in a word and being able or being able to put a period at the end of the sentence. And so the idea is that the activity moves very quickly and that the students 
do some of the writing, but the teacher do, does a lot of the writing. So it keeps it moving. And so um, let's just say the sentence is, um, we went to the park to play. Um, the teacher might say, we worked on the word we this week. It's on our site. It's on our word wall. Who thinks they could write that for us? One child might come up and write we, and then um, the, each word after that, the teacher might let one child write um, the, just the first letter, and then the teacher finishes writing the rest of the word. So whenever they can write about things that they've experienced, things that are authentic, whether it be a thank you note to the lunchroom workers or to the bus drivers or to the principal, um, whenever they can write for authentic purposes, then it's much more meaningful for them. Then also those can be posted in the room and they can become some of the um, really rich print resources that everybody can read because everybody helped to create them. Another really fun thing to do is to have a poetry folder or a poetry notebook. So I love to read simple poems together, things like nursery rhymes, and then we might have an enlarged um text for the whole class to see, but then I make a small copy for everybody. Either they have a folder or a three ring binder. I let them decorate them. And at first, maybe they find and locate certain letters. And then maybe eventually they find and locate words. Maybe they find and locate the rhyming words by the end of the year. Um, here are some examples. Who stole the cookie in the cookie jar or happy birthday? I'm sure you have access to lots of great poems. This is a super fun idea to have a secret student. And the way it works is kind of similar to what we were mentioning a while ago with the um, big books where you're masking things. So the name is in an envelope and then you um, nobody knows whose name is in there. And then you reveal the first letter by just pulling the name out. And then you have the children turn to their partner, someone nearby and guess who do they think that is um, based on the beginning letter. Now, if you have a name chart in your room, that makes it a lot easier for them, right? And then, if, but if you have several children whose name begins with the same letter, then they're, they're just going to have to guess. Then you pull the card out and reveal um, another clue, which would be the second second letter or the third letter. And then whoever the mystery secret student is, once they've guessed it, that child comes up to the front of the room and then the children use that as a chance to ask the child questions to get to know the child better. So they might ask questions like, uh, what kind of things do you like to do when you go home to play and play? And or what are your favorite books? Or do you have a favorite author? What's your favorite food? So whatever it is you can come up with to do, make it fun and meaningful and motivational. If you teach letters this way, then you're going to make it meaningful for the children and that makes it easier for them to remember the letters because they are abstract and there are just so many other activities that you can do. And you may be thinking, well, what more is there because this has been a lot of ideas but in your classroom there's another time of your day i haven't mentioned yet and that's your writer's workshop so um, i believe that beginning the first or second day of school every child should should be expected to write so you give them paper and a pencil and you want them to write a story about anything they want to write about. Um, some will just draw pictures, some will scribble, and some will begin to make um, squiggly letters. Some will make letters that you can read. Some will even write sentences that you that are very legible. But that connection that you make from sound to letter to writing is significant for children and for you as a teacher. Because once I really understood that that reading and writing were reciprocal processes for children. I was able to teach my lowest children um, 
and accelerate them so that they could be at the average of their class. And I know that you can do it too. So the benefits are just huge because number one, it's a great motivator for children to be able for children to be able to have a blank piece of paper and then to write is very motivating. When they um, in, invent the spelling and you can see the sounds that they're able to hear because their writing is a window into what's happening in their minds. And, they're, and so it's like it makes the reading visible for you, which is so important. So you can see if they're writing beginning sounds or ending sounds um, when they write it on the paper, that lets you know what they're able to see when they're reading so that you can help them more. So in essence, what we're talking about today, what I've been sharing with you is how to break the code. They have to know the alphabet before they can read. And so don't put children in level A books if they don't know their alphabet, because you're really going to set them up for failure um, because they won't be able to um, break the code. They won't be able to sound a word out. Um, they won't be able to look at the beginning sound and go all the way through the word. They, they've got to know that meaning drives the reading and they should be taught look at the picture and think and wonder what's this story going to be about and they should know all of that but until they know the phonics piece they're not going to be able to progress alongside of that they have to know some sight words because all words cannot be um, you can't just sound out words you can't look at every word and figure it out just based on the sounds that the letters are making so I hope this has been helpful for you tonight or today whenever you're looking at it. I have a Facebook group called Daily Experiences, Growing Literacy and Leaders. And uh, if you have not joined that group, I would very much like for you to be a part of it. I have a page as well called Daily Experiences, Growing Literacy and Leaders, where I post videos like this and other things that I'm working on in schools. This is my email address. And if you have a question or a concern, I would love for you to email email me. Um, I am a, a, an ELS specialist and Pioneer Risa in North Georgia contracts with me. I'm very proud to be affiliated with them. I have created a YouTube channel so that I can share things like this with teachers. And if you search YouTube for Rhonda Hayes, you should be able to find it. If you would like that page or, and like the videos on that page and subscribe to the channel, then you'll be able to get notifications for videos when I post them. That's really all I have tonight. I hope that you have great success teaching your students the letters, the sounds, and that they'll be fast and flexible word solvers this year. Happy teaching.